Nice try. Appreciate it. Almost there. Yes, we are there. Got it. Cool. Super. Great. So, um, just. Uh, uh, when you finish, I'll bring you to the. Uh, exactly. Great. Thanks. Enjoy. Okay, so I'm returning you. Okay, so I will just uh, read the title of, of the session and you will say the interaction of Biden. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> this is the same as you can see on the projector, yeah, the screen. Oh, okay. No, 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 it's taking from AJMI. But maybe try to uh, yeah, mirror display or something like that. It's trying. Okay, I will try to switch it on and off. to PDF and run it on the computer. Okay.
like to have a demo at the end. Sorry. Okay, so I'll try to find the uh, correct letter, but for the presentation right now, yeah? Uh, yeah, arrows or paper. Okay, we will run another talk. Uh, the title of this talk is OpenStack with Kubernetes Better Together, presented by Pete Barley, uh, who's run port.direct, uh, consultancy specialization uh, in OpenStack and container technologies. Okay. Right, um, unfortunately I can't use my laptop at the moment, which is a bit, bit tricky, but we'll see how we get on. Um, as I said, uh, my name is Pete Burley. I do quite a lot of stuff in combining OpenStack and Kubernetes together. I am currently a core developer on the Cola Kubernetes project and also do quite a lot of uh, contribution on several other efforts combining OpenStack and Kubernetes, including uh, OpenStack Helm, and some other things in the Kubernetes space. Um, so I think, sort of to put this in a bit of context, sort of what's, what's going on here, I initially um, got involved in a lot of this stuff while I was working at a university, doing a PhD research into solar thermal uh, systems, and in that I was running a quite a small, relatively OpenStack cluster for CA, CFD work, and found more and more that configuration management was a problem in this and I, like most PhD students, got very distracted with what I was doing and tried to start playing with the toys around me and then got into Docker and started moving towards containerizing our infrastructure there, which is it sort of expanded out and grown. So I think um, every, everyone here, I imagine, is fairly familiar with OpenStack. Um, I take it all of you are? Yeah. Um, so I think it's worth sort of going briefly over wh where it is at the moment. I mean, it's very much concentrated on virtual machines uh, and now some bare metal provisioning and also some other services. It uh, aims to be hypervisor agnostic, although in my experience, most people tend to run KVM or Zen. Um, it supports a huge number of networking models, which I'll come on to in a bit. Uh, we do sort of state storage primarily in um, database backend uh, with complex orchestration via heat and Mistral services like that. But the main, the main thing is that it's sort of multi-tenancy from the ground up and is supremely, supremely good in that, in that realm. Whereas when we look at uh, Kubernetes, it's very much or orientated solely towards containers. Again, it tries to be agnostic in the way that it does that, although currently Docker is really sort of dominating that scene, although Rocket and uh, other sort of OCI compliant artifacts are starting to, starting to appear. Typically it works on a flat, um, single flat level two domain, um, and we've got our state storage and, and messaging being done via Etsy D as well. Um, and the main sort of difference I think between Kubernetes and OpenStack is that with Kubernetes it's got Sorry, with, with Kubernetes and OpenStack, it's got a very sort of narrow yet focused um, uh, laser focus on what it does. So we get very simple yet powerful abstractions for creating replication controllers, um, so services or VIPs, and then um, ab abstracting out for things like persistent storage as well. The main issue that we find with things like Kubernetes is they tend to be sort of very good at running applications, but not very good at multi-tenancy. So they tend to be occupied just by a single tenant within a cluster at the moment. Um, I think we can sort of summarize this quite, quite effectively here. When we look at sort of the differences between them, they, there's a huge amount of overlap, but the overall takeaway I, I get from this is that OpenStack is something that is very broad in its base, but it's very hard to install and maintain generally. The, the barrier for entry is high, and there is a huge amount of ongoing engagement when it comes to sort of day two activities, which is something that Kubernetes is improving at itself, but it's incredibly good at managing these sorts of applications which, which have this level of complexity. 
So traditionally, um, people have looked at sort of OpenStack as being uh, a very good foundation layer for launching applications tip, uh, like Kubernetes, where it's mostly been launched on top of quite heavyweight cloud infrastructure like OpenStack or EC2 or another public cloud. But, <coughs> but it became sort of quite apparent very on in the early days of OpenStack, uh, sorry, of Kubernetes, that there was the potential for using it to orchestrate OpenStack services. However, the initial feature set that was available did not really allow this because although it was capable of running the API layers quite effectively and the rest of the control pane, we didn't have the features we needed like host networking, host PID and IPC namespaces that we needed in order to enable us to run hypervisors and other networking components. But around about sort of six, seven months ago, we found that we actually had all of the features in place that we needed to, to start making this transition to run the, both the control and the data planes fully within, within Kubernetes. Um, so I think at this stage, we sort of need to ask where, where we're going to try and begin in this journey of running, running these two services together. Because there are obviously a huge amount of moving parts in both of these systems. So we have hosts that we need to run things on, the actual container images that we're going to need to try and orchestrate with our, our platform, the networking to connect both the hosts and the containers together, some con security considerations that we need to pay attention to, and then actually the orchestration level that's going to plug all of these things together. And I think it could be argued that I'm about to start doing this the wrong way around, where I'm going to build it very much in the, the list that we're going through here. Um, but to give a slight sort of preview about where, where this is leading to, um, essentially you want to be able to get it to the stage where to deploy a basic OpenStack cloud that you can just set up a, a master node and edit some basic configuration of that, that system then write out a set of configuration files from that and then start your Kubernetes cluster and have it build itself on from that point there up. And this is something that we've achieved in, in prototypes in a way that I definitely wouldn't recommend deploying in production. We're, we're quite a long way away from that, but the, there are definite sort of signs of promise in the approach that we've been taking. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, the, host, the host operating system that I personally have been using um, for a lot of this development work. Um, and while I, was, while I was looking around for a host to base this on, initially we were using very traditional operating systems like CentOS and Ubuntu. Um, we also did some experimentation with CoreOS. Um, but I, I kept on coming back to um, Atomic Linux and its various flavors, just because the main strength I found from my point of view with this was its um, adaptability and adjustability. So uh, at st stages we were needing to run custom kernels and build things against that, and Atomic gave us the flexibility to do that. Um, and essentially it's, you know, it gives you a lot of the same advantages, I would say, as um, Docker or another container type system, where, or, or even sort of like Git for your operating system, where we can easily control what goes into the artifacts we produce. We can upgrade systems very simply and distribute those upgrades around a cluster in a very efficient manner, and also specify it pretty well. I think the only criticism I really have of Atomic is that um, you need to write the configuration file to produce the image in JSON, which is, I find a little bit unpleasant to do. So if it was in YAML, I'd be totally happy. Um, and for, for this, we actually sort of um, devised a slightly, slightly convoluted build system that allows us to build atomic hosts totally uh, through the Docker build command, where we actually have a four, four Docker files that ultimately create the images that we're using. We have the first one that contains a pristine RPM OS tree um, and all of the assets that we need to do uh, to build the rest of it. We then have another Docker file 
that we run on um, a host, which is the Docker socket open and listening un unsecured on the Docker Zero interface um, for building. And it then launches this first Docker container we've built um, in order to build and um, produce the final RPM OS tree that we can then use to deploy out to different systems. Uh, we then have a third Docker file, which then uh, takes this and then uh, runs Image Factory in order to produce an ISO that it then can serve out as well. Um, and the advantage we found of doing it this way was it meant that the end images that we would produce at each stage were quite small and easy to produce. So the only thing that they really contained within them was a copy of the Docker client and uh, Nginx or Apache in order to serve the end asset out to the cluster. Um, the very last image um, that we have is a set of images that we can use to then build uh, images either for uh, AWS or imaging straight onto bare metal or OpenStack clouds. Okay. So then, then once we have our base, base operating system, we need to actually look at the containers that we're going to start launching onto that. And there's essentially um, three, three projects I'd like to talk a bit about today on that front. There's um, obviously OpenStack Cola, which is very much the heavyweight within this industry, um, which has been going for some time. It very much sort of proved the initial viability of uh, running OpenStack in, in Docker. And actually, right when it started, attempted to orchestrate um, through Kubernetes before reverting to an Ansible-based um, deployment method. And then go on to Harbor, some of the images I've built, and then uh, Yado, which is a new packaging system that we're working on as well. So, as I said, Cola um, was the first, first project sort of really to start in this. It started as a complete system, both building images and um, deploying them. It's now split into three deliverables. Um, Cola, which just does the images themselves. Cola Ansible, which concentrates on Ansible-based deployment of these images. And Cola Kubernetes, which is currently being developed. Um, it, it follows a fairly complex build flow where we use uh, Jinja 2 templated Docker files which gives us a huge amount of um, flexibility. So from one set of Docker files, we can then run our build system to uh, build images either from source or from uh, distribution provided binary packages for a number of distributions. The main downside of this, this method is that it results in very, very large images, sort of typically between 250 and 350 megabytes um, for a service image and with a large number of layers in. Um, so first, first thing I started experimenting with was how we could start reducing this and making it a bit more efficient when it came to distributing these images out to large, larger systems. Um, so I actually used the very first version of the Cola build system, which was based around Bash, to um, run a very simple hierarchical tree build structure where we could record the parents just by um, the directory structure that we were using and also explored using Alpine Linux and other muscle-based Linux systems for building out the control pane. Um, falling back to either CentOS or Fedora for um, systems that we weren't viably able to package within Alpine. And this resulted in a very similar build system um, just with uh, a slightly sort of smaller end result. One of the things that we did there as well was started to install and remove all of the build tooling with each layer so that we weren't carrying that between parent and child images. And with that, with that process, um, we sort of managed to get the image size down from 280, 300 megabytes down to about 67, uh, well, 67 in this case for uh, the Neutron API image, uh, and about half the number of layers. So when it came to pushing it out to a large number of nodes, the rolling updates, that was a lot quicker. And um, something that I've started working on 
within literally the last two or three, two or three months is um, another method of packaging OpenStack within, within Docker. And this takes uh, a lot of the experience that I and another guy called Sam Yapple have, because uh, we got into an argument about the best way to package images. And um, we then really sort of went, went very much back to basics. And some of the stuff that he's done in this field is, is seriously quite impressive. So all of the previous methods have generally relied on some sort of templating or external, external tooling for building out. Um, whereas here, we um, take advantage of um, the OpenStack project called OpenStack Requirements, which gives a list of all of the Python dependencies that a particular OpenStack project may use. We then use this to build a uh, Docker file which contains all of these packages compiled for an operating system as wheels, um, which we can then, from a, another file, by directly accessing the Docker Hub API, pull in just the layer we want and use it as a local repo um, before <coughs> building out the service image that we want. And the advantages of this are pretty, pretty massive. It means that we um, can produce a complete image for an entire service within about two to three minutes on a developer's laptop versus the much longer times that it was taking before. Um, and also, we don't need any external uh, tooling installed at all on, on any of the machines. So there's quite a few organizations are now actually starting to look at the ways that they can integrate this within their CI, CD pipelines, um, because as well as being able to build directly from a source repo, we can then go straight in and pull down a particular commit or anything we need from Garrett and get that going quite smoothly. And the end result from this is an incredibly compact image that's inherently very auditable and can be pulled around very easily and also as much as possible strives to be um, orchestration engine agnostic. So unlike previous attempts, we don't load any configuration data or configuration helpers into the image and offload that job to the orchestrator itself. Okay. So now, now we've sort of got an idea of the, the images that we started playing with for this. Um, we can look at uh, the networking layer um, and something that I was working on uh, with, with that is actually using Neutron um, as the basis for networking Kubernetes. And this, this gives us sort of some potential advantages. I think this again is far way away from being ready for production and a lot of the work that's done here um, is based on prototypes that uh, Tony and other people who were working in the Courier project produced, uh, which I extended out slightly in order to enable them to be used for OpenStack deployment. And what this, what, by providing Neutron as a networking layer for Kubernetes, it allows us to use hosts and um, Kubernetes pods together, which gives us improved security control, um, allows us to apply quality of service and scalability um, to these services very easily. Um, however, it's not all sort of roses in this case because what we, what we found quite quickly is that the reference um, architecture really wasn't, wasn't suitable for operating at this sort of scale where we found uh, huge bottlenecks coming in with things like the level three uh, nodes and the DHCP nodes, which were giving us long provisioning times, um, and so we started looking at alternatives. And when you do that, there's, there's generally sort of the alternative solutions fall into two categories for neutron backends, either rooted solutions, things like Calico and Romana, or um, tunneled solutions like OBN or Midonet. And the main, for, for the work I was doing, I found that the tunnel solutions generally were better because they offered feature parity with what a lot of uh, OpenStack um, operators were expecting when it came to things like supporting overlapping IP um, subnet ranges and floating IPs. Um, and so for this, we did quite a, I've done quite a bit of work with using OVN as the back, backing there, which has the advantage of distributed routing, so we lost the bottlenecks um, that we were experiencing with network nodes, and it also offers incredibly fast provisioning, which is 
really quite significant when you're trying to scale up or down a, a large cluster um, or, or um, deployment of nodes. Okay. The other, the other big advantage that we found there was um, it's easier to put into, con um, into containers and orchestrate with Kubernetes as well because without uh, network namespaces and um, other aspects, there were much less moving parts to deal with, which made it much easier to load, load in. And to, to make this work, um, there's a part uh, called the Raven, which is the, the prototype of what is now becoming Courier, uh, lib, uh, Courier Kubernetes, which is a very simple uh, Kubernetes API watcher, which takes um, Kubernetes um, objects and then converts them into neutron constructs. And with this, we got to the stage where we actually found that using the kube proxy was no longer relevant within our cluster because we were able to replace all of the services that it did with, with neutron elements. So here there's a brief overview of how, how we mapped um, Kubernetes objects into, into neutron objects with um, basically taking pods and prescribing ports to them within neutron uh, services, replacing with load balancer, um, and then applying security groups directly to the containers as well. And something else that started to creep in here is using free IPA as a common um, as a common DNS backend. And this is because in order to provide this sort of um, infrastructure where you have multiple orchestration systems working together, we found that it was quite quite essential to have a common DNS base that would allow all of these things to talk to each other. And Free IPA was really very, very good at doing this and um, letting us tie in together both external DNS and Sky DNS driven by Kubernetes and designate um, from both the OpenStack side of things and then distribute that out to both hosts, virtual machines if necessary, and control plane pods running within the cluster. Um, and then to allow these sort of systems to talk to the outside world, it became it was initially quite complex working out how we could provide a sort of scalable edge edge structure to this, but we um, eventually started using um, uplink pods to allow us to um, can bind to the Docker socket on a host, which then fired up a router container, which in turn created a link local um, address, which allowed traffic to very easily ingress into the cluster and access services as required. And so putting, putting this together, um, you can see how this starts to look in practice, where uh, we have a service, in this case, Mistral, running inside Kubernetes orchestrating pods, which are then displayed and um, held on neutron-backed networks, which then also lets us get up all sorts of details about the actual um, pod itself and then connect how we can connect that into other parts of our OpenStack infrastructure or tie it into, tie it into existing virtual machines. Okay. Another, another part of trying to get, get these systems to work together was working out actually how to manage authentication between them. And there have been efforts to get uh, Keystone talking directly to Kubernetes via a token-based authentication system. But we found that uh, the sort of user, base, user models between these two systems wasn't directly comparable. And so actually... Uh, getting a federated system with our users held externally proved to be very, very useful for that and to allow, to allow a common base between them. Um, and for this, free, free IPA was really an incredibly useful tool because it allowed us to deal with user CRUD and um, act as a CA backing our systems and also provide a DNS layer for, for things together. Um, and for uh, a real-world deployment, you'd obviously want to have an external um, free IPA installation, but we, we found that it worked reasonably well for testing um, 
been launched within a container. Uh, the main problem that we found there was actually, again, adapting it to work with uh, Kubernetes networking. So we bind-mounted a pod to the Docker socket and then launched it via that method. Okay. Um, and this, this then got tied in, so we installed the free IPA client within uh, our Docker, uh, sorry, our atomic hosts, uh, which allowed us to perform host registration and then generate all the certificates that we need and distribute them out to the hosts to allow them to talk to our Kubernetes cluster. Um, the other thing that then, then did was started to use um, PKI and TLS to uh, authenticate all services internally within the cluster. So we use certificates for um, RabbitMQ, MariahDB, and APIs when they talk to each other within the Kubernetes cluster, um, which works incre incredibly well and reduces some load on, on, the key, on certain elements. And then when it came to trying to tie in user accounts between systems, uh, this is where the Fedora's Ypsilon project was, was really quite, quite helpful because it allowed us to use uh, SAML2 authentication to tie users into Keystone um, where we were holding our groups in um, LDAP, which we were accessing directly which means that we had a external, essentially we're holding all of our user info outside of the cluster, which again meant that when dealing with multi-region or multi-site deployments, it works, works quite well. And this, this sort of culminates in just providing a very seamless experience for the end users where they can select a, an identity provider and then very, very quickly just, just get straight into Horizon or, or um, via a wrapper get a token that will then allow them to use the OpenStack CLI. Okay. And so putting, putting, putting it all, all together, um, as, I, as I sort of said at the start, uh, we can package this together in one of, one of a couple of ways. Um, what I was working on with my Harbor project was a very, very simplistic um, a very opinionated deployment, which gives you um, the ability to set up set up a cluster very quickly. And I think, sorry, um, and we should hopefully be able to have a look at that in a second. Um, and what? Yes. So this, this installation method that we came up uh, that I came up with for this was very much a, a prototype. So it was very very simple, very opinionated, relies quite heavily on some pretty pretty ugly tools to do it. Where I was using a lot of sed, bash, and then system d to actually drive services. It's not dry by any means at all. Um, but what it does does do is it just provides quite a nice test test bed and development platform for these sorts of systems. Um, then uh, we can see sort of how the services are constructed here, where we have uh, boot bootstrapping um, jobs that bring, bring up the initial service, um, do things like manage the database, create the database layer, um, and populate it, do all the migrations that we need for that, and then fire up the actual replication controllers or things like Apache or the, the Python service that's running within, within it. And to... Da, da, da. <coughs> Sorry, it'll be pretty, pretty low resolution, but the... <laughs> so the end, the end result we have here is we have all, all of the services split out into individual namespaces um, operating 
either, either in the host network namespace or for the API services operating on the OVN-backed uh, Neutron layer. Um, and if you've not used it before, I can highly recommend Cockpit as a really nice web interface for, for hosts in general, but especially in use with Kubernetes, um, because it allows you to very, very quickly get in, have a look at a service, um, get information up about the pods that are running with it, scale, scale it, or if you want to get in for debugging, um, get, get in, view the actual containers that are running for a service, get the, the logs for a particular thing, or just very quickly open up a shell and see, see what's running within there. Um, and it, it honestly, it makes um, the management of these sorts of systems so much easier. Um, again, you can then, then get uh, all of our data, database volumes for individual things. They uh, can either be mounted um, the way we have it set up at the moment on, on host paths or uh, actually via, via Cinder volumes after, after the initial um, cluster's been brought up and get a, get a quick, quick overview of what's running. And this, again, I'm sorry, sorry about the resolution. Um, this then means that we can get a huge, a huge number of services running Very, very effectively um, and, and pretty, pretty reliably. So if, for example, um, on this all-in-one cluster uh, that I'm running at the moment, we can go in and find, find something pretty, pretty critical, like, ooh, like say, our uh, Keystone API, we can delete that pod and have it have it reschedule very quickly. So obviously, in reality, you'd want to run multiple copies of this, um, but within within a couple of seconds, you can be back back up and running. Hopefully, yeah. Um, so it's really it's really sort of offers a huge level of resilience that you normally normally wouldn't see without much more effort and work. However, as, I, as I've suggested, um, this, this solution uh, is not, not quite, um, did I do it? Is not, is not sort of quite, quite your, what you'd want to use in production by any means at all. Um, so when, I, when I started work on that, that Harbor project, um, there wasn't a package manager available for Kubernetes. But since then, uh, Helm has come on the scene, which really offers, pretend, well, potentially offers to solve a lot of these problems. Um, so, Cola Kubernetes is now using it, um, transferring from its original Jinja 2 system to, to using Helm, uh, which takes a very extreme approach to microservices where every component is wrapped within its own Helm chart. Um, it currently shares its configuration um, and deployment set up with, with Ansible, which is uh, something that is trying to be eradicated as quickly as possible so it can move to its own uh, configuration. And it's intended to be consumed as um, packages, package units which are then driven by operators which, that interact with Helm. And it's, it's very heavily um, in a, a work in progress at the moment that's aiming to be capable of installation and basic day two operations by May. Um, the, other, the other major project in this area that's appearing at the moment is OpenStack Helm, um, which is written totally from the ground up for this package manager. It takes the idea of one chart per service. It performs all of its configuration management within Helm. Um, and it runs today for both development and proof of concept deployment at scale. And it's rapidly iterating um, towards a stable image agnostic base. 
So we've been testing it with, with all of the images that I've mentioned previously, and it's running capably with all of them. Um, it's currently stewarded by AT&T um, Community Development, but they're a really friendly bunch of people, um, and I'd, I'd highly recommend checking, checking the project out and getting, getting involved, because it's at the stage where that's really becoming viable. And so looking at sort of how to actually deploy uh, a Helm-based system, it's fantastically easy um, when you compare it to any other OpenStack deployment I've come across before, where literally within 13, 13 or 14 lines of, um, and commands, you can go from a fresh Kubernetes cluster, in this case just Minikube for a development system, and have a fully operational OpenStack um, deployment up and running. Um, and something that can do just now to sort of demonstrate that is duh, duh, duh. <coughs> is take 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 a service that I, I started during the last um, sorry this morning um, and just launched Horizon and Keystone into it and now actually deploy Glance out to that namespace, which then creates all of the API services and the load balances between it and a, a set of jobs in order to initialize it. Okay. So does anyone have any questions about, about any of that? <laughs> Don't go. <laughs> so quickly. Okay. And as well. Do you have DevCon as well? Thank you. 
Probably the best way. But does it say VGA? I don't think it does. I think okay. it just says HDMI. But we'll try this one. This guy. Is that display porn? Uh, I know, but we have a program problem with uh, HDMI. Okay. Here. I'm horrible with this kind of stuff. So <laughs> this is very messy. <laughs> So, uh, and we will change your resolution to four to three ratio. Uh, it should already be on four to three. The presentation is. Yeah, but it's up to the uh, The screen. Yeah, the screen. Okay. So, so what would you suggest? Uh, fourteen hundred to uh, one fifty. Okay. It should be enough. Ah, all right. Yeah. All right. I've really sensitive. <coughs> Honestly, I forget how to set resolution at the XR and I. Alright, I'm just gonna let it be for now and let it flip on and off, and I'll try and be gentle when I'm hidden to the space bar. doesn't want to show it all. Yeah, <laughs> That's a nightmare. Really. Mm, no sitting. Okay, I'll find Chris and we'll try to solve it somehow. Okay, we have some time, I guess. Yeah, we have a lot of it. All right. So it's it's display portal here, yeah? I get. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> because this. Okay, I'll, I'll send, send okay. it here. Just wait. Awesome. How to pronounce this? Crittenden. Crittenden. 
presentation is visible here, right? Uh, he's working on it. It's not, uh, the HDMI is not working. So, he's going to get somebody to... Oh, he, he went there outside to just get someone? Yes. All right. He said a name, but I can't remember what it was. Kitna. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm terrible with this kind of thing, so I'm just going to leave it to you guys. Ah. Back to my presentation. Oh, hey, good to see you again. Fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, Flo. <laughs> nice to meet you finally. So. Oh, great. The first time you meet me, I get to talk yeah. at you. I <laughs> uh, hope not. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> I'm not the best presenter, but I'll do my best. Uh, I might not do anything at all. We can't get it to show on the screen, so.